very well that they've been that we've been having various interesting initiatives from the regional uh, offices and regional spaces. And so uh, we look forward to a really engaging meeting. The last two sections have focused on defining and financing the green recovery. And they concluded that any recovery that isn't green and inclusive is just postponing the crisis. And the green recovery should address the root causes of social inequality by aligning national economic and development planning and thematic and sectoral planning with the 20 agenda. 30 agenda and investing in transformational projects. It was also reiterated several times that 2030 agenda is currently the best global plan to model a green recovery. And the two enabling conditions to address the green recovery are capacity building and creating an environment to work with civil society and the private sector who are key to the transformation that we're looking for. Five areas for green recovery spending were identified and prioritized in our previous uh, dialogues uh, for this topic, including clean energy, natural capital, green buildings, transportation and connectivity, research and development. Building upon the two previous sessions, today's dialogue provides an opportunity to speak on the regional nexus approaches, focusing on the regional dimensions, experiences and capacities in building back better green recovery finance and the respective socioeconomic and cultural challenges and opportunities. Building on this, the Secretary General's six climate-related actions to shape recovery, which he announced at uh, the Earth Day uh, 22, uh, 21, today's dialogue will consider regional approaches and actions in achieving building back better and resilience through green recovery economy. It will ask questions such as how are the regional commissions and other UN regional entities supporting countries to choose their green recovery pathways? I'm sure Yara will, will come up with all of these questions, so I will not uh, address them here, but I will leave them to you uh, to, to really frame the discussion. But just to say a big welcome and thank you so very much for being here today. Good, after good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia, and good morning from New York to all colleagues and to all participants. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here and um, really to moderate this discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Yera Ortiz de Urbina. I am the Deputy Director of the Regional Commission's uh, New York office, and I'm joined here by a wonderful group of experts and colleagues from the Regional Commissions. And as Lydia was saying, this is indeed um, a great opportunity and it's very fitting that this session, the third session comes after a session on uh, thinking and defining the green recovery to looking at issues of financing and the, the means of implementation. And now moving to action at the regional level where very often we see that is where really the, the, the rubber hits the road and we can start looking at implementation of of this uh, nexus and these integrated approaches to, to current sustainable development challenges. So uh, we have seen indeed in the, in the aftermath of the pandemic and the immediate response, how the action at the regional level has been critical in, in, in devising uh, effective responses to, to the pandemic. Uh, we have seen that with uh, immediate responses in the area of transport, in the area of trade, in, the, in reconnecting the economies. And we have witnessed that in the case of the regional commissions. But we have also seen how these have been the areas where um, the, the, the imperative of connecting the, the, reco the green recovery to the response to the pandemic has become also more, more visible. And uh, from a perspective of uh, the regional commission's office in New York, I mean, this is very relevant, but it, we also see that it's relevant to look at action in the regional level because it's a critical building block of action at the global level. It, it's really a cornerstone of multilateralism. And very often where issues are hard to tackle at the global level, it is the regional level that provides a bit of uh, light and responses. And this is also the case for the theme that brings us together here today to the development of Nexus approaches to the multitude of challenges we are confronting today. So from our office in, in New York, we try to facilitate this exchange and we try to, to really help expand the, the knowledge that is generated at the regional commissions. And this is again, what we are doing today and we are, we are so pleased to, to be in this, in this discussion. Um, this has been become very, um, very relevant and the regional commissions have become very active on these issues uh, 
uh, most recently in the context of, uh, I would, shouldn't say most recently because they have been going on for a while now, in the context of the regional forums for sustainable development that have really now consolidated as a, at the moment in the, in the regions for review of the 2030 agenda, for looking at, at questions of, uh, of, um, of the nexus approaches with the climate uh, action and also in the context of the of the reform of the UN development system, uh, we have now the recently established regional collaborative platforms, the issue-based coalitions, or these are platforms for action and demand-driven uh, and responding to priorities of countries that try to integrate all the dimensions of the of the of this of the of the sustainable development and the responses to, to the pandemic. Um, most recent examples of, of this type of actions emerging from the regions and, and where we have been involved and from, from the New York and from the headquarters perspective has been, in addition to the broader response to the pandemic, we have had very nice uh, and innovative uh, initiatives and collaborations in the area, for example, of extractive industries, where the regional commissions have really looked at from a bottom-up approach to, to responses to, to really turn extractive industries in an engines of sustainable development. We are also working very actively, for example, to develop an integrated visions from a regional level on the, on the, on the food systems uh, to contribute to the food system summit. So these are examples of, uh, of, of action and collaboration that I think uh, uh, are relevant and demonstrate the, the, the value addition that, that, uh, of the work that regional commissioners do. I'm going to stop here. I think I've talked already enough and it's clear to everyone uh, why this is important and why this is a very fitting discussion to, to conclude this series of, of dialogues. And I'm going to immediately pass the floor to our, our first uh, speaker. And our first speaker in, in our list for today is uh, Mr. Jean-Paul Adam from uh, the Economic Commission from Africa. Our team colleague, uh, Jean-Paul, is the, the Director of the Technology, Climate Change and Natural Resource Management Division. And uh, he's going to share with us uh, the perspective of the Economic Commission for Africa on, on how uh, which efforts have been undertaken to accelerate climate action and decarbonization from the African perspective. And this is extremely interesting because uh, our colleague Jean Paul is, is also very involved in supporting the, 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 uh, this effort, supporting countries achieve the 2030 agenda and to align this to also the very relevant regional framework of the agenda 2063. So these are, um, these are very important efforts going on in the, in the African uh, region. And, Without further ado, I'm going to give him the floor. And dear Jean-Paul, the floor is all yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Yera, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, or good morning uh, for those connecting from uh, the other side of the, uh, the Atlantic. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to have the chance to share some of these perspectives on the African pathway towards a green recovery and how we build forward better. So the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa has focused its efforts in supporting African countries in deciding how they can invest the limited resources that they have to get the most impact to build back better from COVID-19, but build forward better also to address the issue of climate change. And climate change in, in Africa, actually, according to the, uh, the statistics that we have, actually has as big or in some cases bigger impacts than COVID-19 on African economies. The research that we have done has shown that uh, it's costing African countries on average 5% to respond to climate related disasters. The projections that we have done till 2030 show that it will continue to cost around 5% on average for African countries, but in some outlier countries and regions, it will cost up to 15% of GDP, and that includes the regions such as the Sahel. So this impact is going to be the biggest uh, factor that affects our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals. And the, we are faced with a situation where Africa has also contributed the least towards uh, uh, global warming and uh, with, with, uh, uh, with Africa representing less than 4% of global emissions while having 17% of the world population. So one of the issues that we face in Africa is why the need to address the, uh, the investment in a green recovery. Uh, there is a perception sometimes that it costs more uh, and that, it will, be, uh, that it, will, it will create too much disruption for it to be feasible. So the work that we have done through case studies is to show that uh, this is not the case. And in fact, the 
Uh, if I cite the example of South Africa, which was the first case study that we did, we showed that by investing in uh, green sectors, which were particularly in the context of South Africa, energy, uh, nature-based solutions, sustainable uh, agriculture, uh, uh, sustainable uh, transport infrastructure, um, and uh, retrofits to buildings, that you would get 250% more jobs than if you were to invest in similar related uh, fossil fuel-based sectors. And you would create 420% more value addition within the economy. We are doing a few further countries and we have completed already DRC, Egypt, uh, and Kenya. And all of the case studies uh, show similar results and all show that you get more jobs and more value addition by investing in these key sectors. The sectors that really uh, uh, are across the board important, firstly, uh, energy. And this is because Africa is the least uh, connected to energy of all regions um, on the planet, unfortunately, with almost 600 million people still lacking access to energy. So investing in energy is a kickstart to the, to the economy across the continent and allows the development of SMEs and allows many other aspects of infrastructure to be, uh, to be maximized, for example, the digital transformations. Sustainable transport is also a key factor. Uh, by connecting people better across the continent, we can uh, create a bigger impact and also multiply the opportunities of the African continental uh, free trade area. Uh, food security, and uh, Yera mentioned the, the global initiative, and in Africa, this is particularly important, where uh, Africa is particularly food insecure. Uh, over 25% of rice, which is the staple, is imported uh, from just one country, from India. And this has been uh, a big, a big, has had a big impact on imports in the recent situation they're faced in, in terms of COVID-19. So food security based on climate smart agriculture is another key area. And nature-based solutions are also critical because we are seeing that there is a unfortunate uh, increase in deforestation in Africa, which is very dramatic. So some of the solutions, firstly, it has to be predicated on the availability of upfront financing to invest early. And this is where Africa is at a disadvantage because uh, Africa is not able to access markets cheaply and is completely dependent on the development finance institutions. Uh, the possibility of raising uh, finance locally is limited due to the uh, low income levels of the population, but also uh, Africa has been affected by fiscal deficits for a number of years due to relatively low levels of economic growth. Even though it has been over 3%, uh, the, uh, Africa is paying four times more in debt servicing than it is able to raise in terms of revenues. So we need to upfront the financing available, and this is where the 100 billion annual financing for climate resilience is going to be particularly important. But we also want to develop innovative financing and some of our work has been supporting countries to access this innovative financing. And this includes reducing the cost of private capital uh, and, and addressing the issue of a risk premium on African bonds. Also facilitating the issuance of African green and blue bonds, recognizing that Africa currently has less than 1% of the global sustainable bond market. Also exploring opportunities for debt restructuring where necessary write-offs to be explored but also uh, examining the opportunity for debt swaps. And the final point would be hopefully at COP26 to get an agreement on global carbon price at at least $50 per ton, which is would align with the Paris Agreement and which would create significant opportunities within Africa for offsets and raising finance that can be invested in climate resilience and creating livelihoods that will respond to COVID-19. Thank you so much and back to you, Yara. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jean Paul, for articulating so well the, the very strong uh, uh, economic case for decarbonization in, in, in Africa, the opportunity to, to create jobs um, and to, and at the same time, address uh, critical issues like uh, access to, to energy, sustainable transport, et cetera. And as well, uh, uh, the, 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 the innovative finance opportunities and the and that are being explored to, to address the critical financing challenge to, to, to really to accelerate climate action in the region. 
Uh, next speaker is going to be our STEAM colleague, Ms. Rim Neshdawi, Chief of Food and Environment Policies and Sustainable Development in ESQUA. And ESQUA has, uh, for many years, I think, uh, really worked on nexus approaches and the water, food, and energy nexus. And, uh, and at the same time, looking at very specific uh, challenges and vulnerabilities in, in that particular region. So. Uh, Looking forward to, to hearing from you, dear Rim, uh, your perspectives on, on, the, on the action in the region in terms of uh, decarbonization and climate action. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yara, for the introduction and, and um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, actually, um, our region, the Arab region, is a, a major hotspot for climate change. Our region is among the, the most uh, adversely affected and, and among the least uh, able to cope uh, with the anticipated shocks uh, at the regional, um, the, the social, economic, and natural systems. Um, the region suffers from uh, a deep scarcity of, of uh, water, of arable lands, um, uh, and, and in some parts uh, uh, also on energy. Um, we, we suffer badly on, on the uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, fronts as well. We have one of the highest uh, um, uh, poverty uh, uh, rates uh, reaching around 30% of the population, specifically um, uh, that we have many uh, countries uh, suffering from uh, conflicts and, and uh, instability, and this increases the poverty rates even higher, reaching um, sometimes over 45% uh, uh, of the population. This is a, 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 an important issue to, to look into uh, when we talk about climate action and, and its uh, relationship to poverty. Climate change um, is not an environmental challenge. It is a fundamental threat to development in, in our lives. And uh, without serious action, uh, um, it's uh, likely that it will push millions further into uh, poverty in our region um, and, and definitely limit opportunities for a sustainable development. Uh, if we don't confront climate change, the region will not be uh, pursuing any uh, uh, development. Um, now, uh, what have we done? Um, Yara mentioned uh, two very important issues that the regional commissions are, are part of, and that is the uh, uh, Arab Forum for Sustainable Development, where this is a multi-stakeholder um, uh, forum on annual basis where they come and, and, and consult and, and share experiences, the whole region, on, on what to do on developmental issues. And also we are um, uh, uh, leading as regional commissions on, on the issue-based uh, coalition and, and the issue uh, of, of climate change and environment and natural resources is high on our agenda in the region. And that's why we dedicated an issue-based uh, coalition between um, all the regional uh, uh, UN system organizations and, and um, uh, to, to, com to, to uh, come together and uh, address the uh, environmental uh, challenges and climate change uh, issues. Um, in addition, of course, with the U United Nations uh, systems uh, organization, we have the, the main uh, uh, regional organization, the uh, uh, League of Arab States uh, supporting the issue-based uh, coalitions. Uh, uh, for us at the regional level, our member countries have, have requested that we establish an Arab um, Center for Climate Change Policy uh, back in 2018 um, to, to continue working on uh, uh, different fronts on, uh, for climate action. And actually the um, Arab Center for Climate Change uh, Policies established within ESQA uh, takes uh, uh, or, or works at different levels, uh, works on capacity building, and this was identified as, as an issue um, to, to take forward uh, the, the uh, uh, green uh, uh, building back better. And uh, we believe that this is a cornerstone in our uh, region. 
capacity building and technical assistance for um, uh, public institutions in our region are, are uh, uh, crucial. Um, uh, specifically in terms of uh, climate change assessments, uh, adaptation, mitigation, supporting negotiators and negotiations, um, in addition to developing uh, programs and, and uh, uh, policies in that regard. Um, there has been also a great work on, on the Nexus uh, uh, front where uh, uh, ESQUA has been leading on uh, the work of uh, uh, water, uh, in water, food, and climate change issues. Uh, they are um, at, at the regional level, we have established a ministerial, uh, uh, joint ministerial um, a working group and session uh, uh, on, on water and, and, and food. The ministers of agriculture with the ministers of water meet uh, biannually to discuss a common issue. And, and this was um, uh, a, a unique setup for uh, uh, such a ministerial uh, meeting and it is prepared for by a technical uh, committee that uh, touches upon uh, issues of, of concern for the, the, the two sectors. Um, and we provide the technical uh, support for these uh, committees and for the ministerial uh, uh, meetings. Um, also, uh, ESQUA has been uh, uh, providing uh, uh, mainstreaming uh, uh, climate action into national development plans, supporting member countries in that uh, uh, direction, specifically uh, with uh, um, uh, looking into uh, right now, the debt swap uh, uh, for climate, the debt for climate swap, and we are discussing uh, these issues uh, bilaterally with countries and and the, the regional level through regional consultations uh, with international partners. Um, uh, we definitely depend on on the. the wide networks of partners and and it was discussed that uh, one of the uh, key factors is working with the private sector and the civil society and this is where we uh, uh, push for the, the involvement of uh, civil society in our uh, consultations to ensure that uh, they are part of it and and to to ensure that their perspective is also um, well taken in our uh, 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 issues. Regarding uh, pilot interventions, we have uh, several pilot interventions. We have done uh, case studies on the impact of climate change on water availability and uh, 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 agricultural productivity with case studies uh, reaching nine. And uh, we have noticed the impact of climate change on, on these uh, um, on, on the productivity, and I guess my time is out. I have a lot of uh, uh, discussions on, on uh, these case studies, but we can uh, discuss uh, during the, the, the session further. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rim. This, this was great, and thank you for bringing to the fore the, the, the challenges and really the core poverty challenge as well in the, in the region that we, we have to, to really always uh, keep in mind. And, and also to, for illustrating uh, very well really this convening role that is so critical precisely to develop these integrated and nexus approaches and, and, uh, and the, 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 the support that is provided in terms of capacity building, but also bringing together the different ministries, the different stakeholders to, to devise uh, solutions to, to challenges. And, uh, and for the examples that uh, some of them are actually replicated in, in other regions, like the, 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 the idea of the debt swaps for uh, climate action, which is an, you know, an initiative that we have seen also with uh, perhaps some variations uh, replicated in, in, other, in other parts of the world with the support of the, of the regional commission. So thank you so much for this. And I look forward also to hearing about the, the pilot uh, experiences, perhaps in the next round of, uh, of discussion, as, as we said, thank you. So uh, we're going to move now to uh, another region and we're traveling around the world here. Um, so the next speaker is going to be Mr. Jose Luis uh, Samaniego Leiva. He's the chief of the Sustainable Development and Human Settlements Division in ECLAC in uh, Santiago. And uh, 
you are all um, still familiar with ECLAX work and the, the, the long standing focus on the challenge of, of uh, um, equality. And, and what I found, um, what I find very interesting in the context of this discussion is how now ECLAC is still focusing on, on the really core objective of, of equality in the region, in a region where countries are very, um, uh, economics are very commodity based, how they are now also incorporating the sustainability aspects and, and moving forward with this initiative of the big sustainability push. So uh, uh, I'm not going to steal your thunder, Jose Luis, so please, uh, dear Jose Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yera. Thank you very much. And good morning to all our colleagues. Uh, that is true. We have been focusing on, on the long-term issues for quite a while now. And the pandemic, what came to do was to underline the weaknesses that we were already carrying structurally. Uh, it is not idle to say that the pandemic has uh, made us uh, go back in time, at least in GDP per capita, by 10 years, and in terms of poverty incidence by 14 years. And we know how easy it is to lose ground and how difficult it is to recover it. We have now 20 million more poor and extreme poor in the region uh, due to the recession of the pandemic. So we were focusing on, on what Jean Paul has uh, rightly pointed out, a wrong narrative on a way to try to integrate the, the three dimensions of uh, uh, sustainable development, social, environmental, and economic. And we made a strong effort to measure uh, the positive impacts of sectoral choices on narrowing the gaps on the three fronts simultaneously as the Agenda 2030 calls for. So uh, when the pandemic came, we uh, published two uh, books. One is called Not Building Back Better, but um, Building a New Future and Building a Better Future. Why? Because there are choices in terms of policy and sectoral investment that can reduce these three gaps simultaneously. Let me give you a, an example uh, based on the energy sector. If we decide to invest to uh, bring up the participation of renewable energies in Latin America and the Caribbean, the cost is lower than maintaining the present trajectory, the business as usual trajectory, with an addition of seven more million employments, lower costs of energy for the general economy, and of course, a much lower carbon footprint. Right now, we have uh, such a social gap that we should be growing at a rate of at least 4% a year, which is very challenging, particularly in the context of the recession, with a strong distributional effort in order to eliminate poverty and be able to achieve the Agenda 2030. But at the same time, we are unable to grow at that rate, of, at that speed, because our economic structure is dependent on imports and that establishes a structural limit to the speed that we can grow with. The social rate of growth is higher than the uh, external restriction rate of growth that we can achieve. And the external rate of growth in turn is higher than what the Paris Agreement calls for. So we have to find specifically those sectors that allow to reconcile these three rates of growth. In line with what uh, our ECA colleague said, Jean Paul, it's renewable energies, it's sustainable transport, it's retrofitting buildings, is uh, upgrading public spaces, is strengthening the economy of care, it's sustainable tourism, it's uh, nature-based solutions. All of them are low uh, environmental footprint. In highly intense in, in, in wages and, and labor, and they can be also lower in terms of imports. So why aren't we focusing on these sectors? And there's a big challenge in, ter challenge in terms of the alignment of public policies to change the relative profitability of those sectors that we want to favor. And if we think that 
that profitability of the sectors that we want to impulse depends on fiscal loads, on financial costs, on regulatory enablements, on research and development, it's clear that we have to align public policies to change relative profitability in favor of these sectors that we have been talking about and against the sun setting sectors. That can be done, but the narrative is not yet helping. So we are very focused on changing and trying to change that narrative and show that there are synergies uh, between the, the, the three dimensions of sustainable development, if we are able to enhance these traction sectors that we want to develop and not the other sectors. Unfortunately, the old narrative, the 20th century narrative is still very much alive. And what we have seen during the pandemic is that investment in brown sectors is still four times higher than the investment on greener sectors. And we may be risking closing the window to really establish a new narrative and a change in the patterns of investment in favor of the sectors that should be tracking the economy. Back to you, Yara. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jose Luis. And, and, uh, and thank you for, for us for really Mm, hitting the, you know, it's the, the core of the issue is uh, to 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 change the, the this narrative and and the regional commission's effort in the in the regions are are critical in this regard and to to work to align all these public policies uh, address the trade offs and 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 create and support the creation of enabling environments for from the regulation perspective also but also attracting uh, the necessary uh, finance and building the necessary partnerships and again this is this brings me back to this uh, convening role that we've been referring to with uh, with previous examples uh, as well uh, i think we, we have a lot of substance there to to dig in later in the second round of of discussion so uh, thank you very much again jose luis and now I'm going to, to move to the Europe, European Commission, um, I mean, the Economic Commission for Europe uh, region. Uh, and I have to say before uh, giving the, the floor to, to our distinguished colleague, Mr. Marco Kainer, Director of the Environment Division, that in the case of ECE, uh, we have seen um, uh, very, a lot of uh, groundbreaking work in, in developing precisely uh, um, critical regional normative frameworks on, on transboundary issues that have been also used in, in other regions and where this type of interregional dialogue has proved uh, very, very useful. So um, ECE has also worked extensively in the last few years on the, on, on, on the concept of circular economy and, and they are moving forward on this. And again, um, it is uh, therefore very, very good that we have uh, Mr. Marco here. And without further ado, please, um, Mr. Marco Kainer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to exactly, as you say, Ira, to give you an overview on what we do in UNEC. And a lot of our work, uh, of course, is based on our multilateral environmental agreements. Um, but it's not only limited to the area of uh, environment. Through all the sub-programs we uh, contribute of uh, recovering from the pandemic and the subsequent economic crisis. And uh, if we can, maybe cynically, you will find it say, if there's something good with the current crisis, then it's uh, that uh, it enhances work that we already started before on greening the economy and on uh, establishing a circular economy. I think now is a window of opportunity because these are no regret measures uh, to, to green the economy, to create jobs and to, um, to produce uh, environmentally more sound. And besides the, the measures that are in the health sector itself, where WHO and others are looking at, what can a regional commission do? I think, uh, as, uh, as colleagues already said, it's in the area of uh, uh, environment and, and uh, economics. And here I would like to share with you briefly six concrete examples from our region, uh, how we can recover and uh, green the economy at the same time. 
Um, the first is uh, building resilience through better water management. You mentioned uh, conventions, we have a water convention, and all of you know that uh, water is the main uh, channel through which climate change um, influences ecosystems, uh, livelihoods, and also the well being of, of societies. And uh, water related disasters are the most destructive of all uh, natural disasters. I just want to mention floods, droughts, and storms. Now, Due to uh, climate change, uh, extreme uh, precipitation events will become more likely, more intense, and uh, more frequent by the end of this century. So we have to uh, address this issue already. Um, disasters also do not know any borders, and that's why there are also transboundary consequences, and, and as a result of that transboundary cooperation uh, will need to be strengthened even more. And to do so, we have these multilateral environmental um, uh, agreements. Um, a second uh, area I would like to mention is the uh, contributions of uh, forests to climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, because, you know, forests are one of the major uh, sinks or reservoirs of, of carbon. And uh, the use of wood also helps uh, mitigating climate change in many ways. Uh, if we just take, for example, the construction sector, uh, which accounts for around 6% of global energy consumption and 11% uh, of energy related uh, CO2 emissions, then uh, we clearly see that wood materials can contribute substantively uh, to moving towards sustainability. And you might recall some years back, we elaborated in UNECE the so-called Rovaniemi plan for, uh, Rovaniemi action plan for the forest sector uh, in a green economy, which is the framework plan uh, to enhance and also to inspire an, um, well, an integrated approach to, ad uh, to address climate change through mitigation and adaptation. It's about uh, substituting wood from sustainable sources for uh, non-renewable materials and, and energy. It's also to uh, make uh, the uh, production more efficient and uh, processing and also the uh, use of uh, wood raw material. Um, Sequestration uh, of, of carbon, I already mentioned here, wood is and uh, forest ecosystems play a very important role. Um, a third area we are working is uh, on, on buildings and, and climate, meaning high performance buildings, because buildings, as you know, they consume over 70% of electric power. And uh, some statistics say they um, are responsible for 40% of all uh, CO2 emissions. So that's why high performance buildings can uh, deliver on the climate challenge by reducing um, energy requirements of the buildings and their operations to a point at which uh, residual needs can uh, be met by no or low carbon energy sources. Um, a, a typical building in New York, for example, consumes, for, uh, consumes 490 kilowatt hours per square meter uh, per year. Whereas with, uh, if we apply the UNEC framework guidelines for energy efficiency uh, standards in buildings, we could bring it down actually to 90 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. Now, uh, fourth area is, of course, on uh, the air quality, which is also important in the context of uh, uh, climate change, because burning uh, fossil fuel releases uh, air pollutants and greenhouse gases. And uh, that's why reducing the, these emissions will also uh, tremendously help to improve the air quality and uh, address climate change uh, at the same time. Um, for example, some of the air pollutants we are dealing with are also climate relevant and uh, known as uh, short-lived uh, climate pollutants. Uh, for example, uh, ozone, black carbon, 
which is a, a component of uh, particulate matters and mainly black carbon if it comes to uh, snowy areas or to the uh, pole areas has a, a huge impact on uh, uh, covering uh, the these white areas uh, uh, changing the albedo and thus uh, contributing uh, to global warming and, and climate change. So that's why the uh, air convention that we have can, can uh, reduce uh, emissions. And uh, in order to track that under the Aarhus Convention, we have a so-called uh, pollutant release and transfer register uh, protocol on that. And here we can trace up to the uh, down to the facility uh, level uh, where the, these uh, substances are um, uh, emitted. And this information, of course, is very important and needs to be uh, assessed online in order to make changes. Now, um, methane, uh, our colleagues from uh, the energy division are dealing with that. Uh, as you know, methane has a huge uh, impact and is at least 25 times uh, uh, as important as carbon dioxide. Others says it's up to 180 times. It depends how you see it. Uh, anyway, uh, reducing uh, methane emissions is uh, necessary through uh, enhanced methane management and uh, that is what the ECE uh, Environment Division is looking at, also in the areas of coal, natural gas, and, and oil. Then uh, my last example is uh, more from the area of transport. It's uh, about regulations for cleaner vehicles, because the transport sector is also a significant uh, source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we can say that around half of the global emissions uh, that come from inland transport and domestic aviation stems from our uh, pan-European uh, region. Um, so it's clear that addressing climate change requires effective solutions for cleaner vehicles uh, that can reconcile the growing transport needs with the need to reduce the emissions. And here we have uh, the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, Working Party 29, that uh, develops regulations that are um, increasing the uh, vehicle's energy efficiency and at the same time lowering emissions. So with these uh, six examples, I think that's fine to set the scene and I'm looking forward to questions in the uh, next round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marco. This was a uh, very, very interesting and, and very helpful examples also um, to, to understand better how all the, the sectoral expertise that you have in EC, uh, how you apply that to, to very specific uh, challenges in, in, in your region, which are very different when, when you haven't heard other regions uh, uh, perhaps looking more at questions of access to energy in Africa, how the questions of energy efficiency buildings are, are critical in the EC region and, and the work that you have been doing in this regard, as well as in transport, uh, pollution, etc. And, and it's, very, it's been very helpful to hear how this, uh, the development of these regional normative frameworks how are also uh, helping and how they offer also good uh, learning uh, opportunities for, for, uh, for other regions around the world. Um, so thank you again, and looking forward to, to the second round again to, to go a bit deeper on some of these examples. And now um, the last uh, region on, on my list, uh, not the least, is going to be the Asia Pacific uh, region, and we are moving to to ESCAP. Um, and well, uh, the, the Asia Pacific region and the impact of the pandemic has really demonstrated and shown that the enormous um, uh, vulnerabilities that exist uh, in the region, in a region where we have seen also a very deep and remarkable uh, economic uh, uh, transformation in the last few years. So it's very, it's going to be very interesting to hear about this region, a very um, and also region that is contributing um, widely to climate change, and but it's also very uh, vulnerable to, to 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 disasters. And for that, we have our esteemed uh, colleague uh, Kurt Garrigan, and he's the section chief of the Environment Development and 
no, excuse me, Sustainable Urban Development Environment and Environment of the uh, Sustainable Development Division in SCAP. Dear Kurt, please apologize if I didn't read your title correctly. You got <laughs> the, it. Floor, the floor is you got it quite well. Uh, and, and apologies. <laughs> Yeah. Apologies on behalf of Stefan Svetti, who was supposed to uh, join, but um, had, had some difficulties um, this morning, this evening. Uh, and, and thanks for the for the opportunity to, to share some of the work that SCAP is doing. Um, in our region, we see that the you know the, the crisis of the COVID nineteen pandemic has really been an asymmetrical shock. Um, that countries have been affected differently, uh, with possible greater economic divergence within and among countries. Uh, those with well-developed health systems, infrastructure, and economic stability, um, as you could imagine, were, were perhaps better positioned initially for the recovery. But the impact of the subsequent waves of the pandemic is still changing the dynamic. Uh, we see current waves in Vietnam and Thailand, where, where we're based, and um, the struggles here with, um, with vaccination. Much of the economy is still closed, um, and in, in, in Japan. Uh, so there remains the risk of a K-shaped recovery where some co countries will recover faster than others. Uh, nevertheless, the shock in, in almost all countries has exposed serious structural weaknesses and fault lines um, across the region. And that we see the, uh, the repercussions of the pandemic um, early on had a dramatic positive impact on air and water quality uh, and a significant decrease in, in greenhouse gas emissions as has been well documented and, and and addressed by previous speakers. So we were able to see really the extent to which the business as usual um, approach had been detrimental to the environment. Um, but we also see very quickly that, that uh, the rebound effect and that this new reality has created room for new and different kinds of environmental hazards, uh, such as the additional flows of waste materials from plastic and food packaging, as well as uh, medical equipment and masks and, and gloves. And um, the increase in, in marine plastics, uh, much of those um, being generated from, from urban areas. Um, so the primary focus on, on continuing economic activities and recoveries here within the region without fully realizing the potential opportunities to accelerate environmental actions really could be a, a significant mistake going forward. Um, we've monitored uh, here at SCAP the region's response to the pandemic and to what extent um, the crisis has triggered policy responses that reached or have the potential of reaching what, what uh, has been characterized as the sweet spot where COVID-19 responses climate change action and poverty reduction uh, initiatives can converge. Uh, we've documented that um, governments have introduced about 400 measures since the begin beginning of the pandemic uh, for economic and social safety nets uh, to directly support citizens and businesses. Um, but little over a hundred of those measures were identified with the achievement to actually reach that sweet spot. So, um, not enough are really directly tackling climate change within six key sectors that would include energy and transport, air travel and tourism, uh, land use, uh, water and waste, and disaster risk management. Um, and only about 58% of those were, were in the prior set of nationally determined contributions. Uh, and most of the new measures, um, and there, there are very few of them, uh, fewer than, than 20, um, are really focused in the disaster risk management um, sector. The largest greenhouse gas emitters um, are taking action towards uh, mitigation and adaptation. We've seen um, uh, a number of countries since the pandemic um, indicate uh, carbon neutrality targets. Uh, China, for instance, has launched a green recovery plan and pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by, by 2060. Um, and this commitment alone is expected to reduce global warming projections if it's achieved um, by uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 Celsius and will place China uh, in a leading position towards tackling climate change. But we see climate neutrality targets by Japan, by uh, Korea, Nepal, Bhutan, um, Singapore and others, uh, New Zealand. Um, 
but we, we, we still believe that the, the efforts being made um, on environmental uh, action is still insufficient. There's only one country in the region, and that's New Zealand, that has used the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to act and bring new policy actions in all of those six sectors measured, uh, mentioned above. Um, and only about 19 countries of the 53 in the SCAP region have introduced um, a new policy since the beginning of the pandemic that addressed both COVID-19 and climate change. Um, so we see as the, you know, as the updates to the nationally determined contributions are, are finalized this year and, and released closer to COP, that there still is an opportunity um, for um, COVID-19 recoveries and climate policies to, to uh, intersect. We've come up with a few possible explanations um, as to why there's been limited action. Um, many countries um, previously lacked climate ambitions and, and perhaps still the urgency uh, of climate action is not fully understood. Uh, for some countries, there's still the disintegrated governance system where NDC policies are designed um, essentially in a silo or a vacuum and are, not, and are not mainstreamed across all sectors and do not take into account subnational actions and local actions. And then there are still financial obstacles and the lack of political will to, to take um, aggressive uh, action on climate change. And there's probably some reluctance and, and hesitancy, not knowing what the uh, full financial impact of the pandemic will be. Um, in, in this region, I think like elsewhere, but um, because the Asia Pacific region is still rapidly urbanizing, cities um, are seen as the epicenter of the pandemic. Um, and in many of the secondary cities where most of the, the population and demographic changes are occurring, where the, the, the rates of urbanization um, are, are um, increasing, there's still poor infrastructure, there's lack of disaster preparedness, uh, and these were made more evident um, as transmission clusters uh, from COVID were seen in informal settlements across the region. Uh, there has been considerable impact from reduced economic activity in cities, uh, which may further strain their abilities uh, to provide basic urban services, to expand the infrastructure to meet the demands. Um, and so the infrastructure gap may expand and urban inequalities, which are already a significant issue in this region, may uh, continue to widen. So we have some recommendations that we'd like to bring forward. One is that um, city, uh, countries cannot afford to separately budget and tackle COVID-19 COVID recovery and climate action, uh, that there needs to be an integrated response and obviously recoveries, as we've all um, said, should be climate responsive. Um, we see that the framework for building back better uh, and achieving that sweet spot really needs to look at broadening social protections, uh, investing in sustained economic recovery that include progressive um, tax reforms uh, and uh, potential taxes on carbon. Uh, strengthening the connectivity and supply chains. Uh, paperless trade, for instance, has, been a, has uh, seen a significant progress in this region uh, and is uh, important to also closing the digital divide. And there are opportunities to, um, to reduce environmental impact through, uh, through paperless trade. Um, we see regional cooperation as, as key to the, to the region's biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, and especially um, to address the issues of marine pollution, overfishing, uh, and coral reef degradation, and species loss. And um, this year with, with CBD discussions um, ongoing, we, we see that this region is especially vulnerable uh, and needs to take significant action. The last point I would make is um, on air, air pollution. I think it's been mentioned before. What we saw during the, the lockdowns uh, was a window of opportunity um, as uh, the air quality improved uh, temporarily. Uh, but there is an opportunity to, to strengthen regional cooperation uh, and apply new technologies. Uh, we're doing some work on the application of satellite data and information combined with machine learning to understand the sources uh, of air pollution 
and help to mainstream the science-based solutions that were developed by UNEP and the CCAC. And we hope to get to a, a regional modality to address air pollution. Um, on cities in particular, I, I think we, we provided some normative guidance um, prior to the, the pandemic that focused on four thematic areas that all cities, regardless of their starting point or level of development should focus. Um, and they include urban and territorial planning, essentially as the basis for sound decision making and, and managing urban growth. The second is urban resilience to build the capacities of local communities to better prepare for respond to um, uh, shocks and stresses, whether they be natural disasters, economic shocks, or pandemics. Uh, the application of smart city technologies, um, and now is the opportunity for emerging cities uh, to leapfrog traditional patterns of development. And finally, urban finance. Uh, and this is where we come back to um, you know, how recoveries and uh, finance can come together because there are significant opportunities uh, to address uh, both um, climate change issues, reduce vulnerabilities, um, make progress against the 2030 agenda uh, where the city, where uh, SDGs intersect in cities and um, to, um, to, to build uh, the capacities of cities to contribute to those global development agendas. With that, I think I've run over my time, so I'll, I'll turn it back to you, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kurt. And thanks first for, for stepping in and, and for bringing us this very, this very important um, perspectives. Uh, and, and it's very interesting to, to hear really about the impacts in the region, but also uh, the, your efforts to, to really help countries identify that uh, sweet spot, as you say. And th that also speaks to, to the question of the narrative that our colleagues from ECLAC were referring to, to before to really the, the efforts that the, the regional commissions are undertaking to really support this, this updating and this changing of, of the narrative to, to find, to help countries identify uh, that sweet spot. Uh, and it's also interesting to hear that while we were all very excited to, to obviously um, hear China's announcements in terms of the carbon neutrality targets, it's, it's interesting to hear that there is still a lot of room for improvement and for action in, in the region and, and the opportunities around the revision of the review of the NDCs and also uh, I would say the, 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 the plans to, to implement and to advance implementation of the, of the 2030 agenda. And obviously the, as well the, the opportunities for, for action and uh, uh, at, the, at the city level at the urban, in urban centers in particularly in, in your region and the efforts on, on air pollution that uh, we have heard very recently also in the context of the regional forum and, and on the context of your collaboration in the issue-based coalitions that this is a critical area for your region. So thank you for bringing it to, to the discussion. So we have now um, concluded the, the first round of presentations from the five regions. Uh, and I'm going to, I mean, all, all of our participants have really provided very good perspectives of what are the critical challenges and, and, the, and the actions that, uh, that every region is uh, envisaging in, in to develop these uh, nexus approaches. And I'm going to open now for a second round of, uh, of more uh, specific interventions. And I'm going to ask uh, our colleagues to, to limit their interventions, I've been told, to two minutes instead of three. Please uh, try to, to be as concise as possible and specific as possible and stay within the, the two minutes limit. Um, and what I'm going to be asking is each of you to elaborate a little bit more on, on uh, lessons that, that you have been learning. If you can already speak of any successful uh, experience in building forward a, a green and circular economy and the lessons that you can share already at this early stage, one year into the, the pandemic. Um, and also, uh, since we are a bit uh, now in a bit uh, in a, in in a in a response model in a short term modality, how hard are you looking already to 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 balance the, the short term demands with the long term policy responses of these these long term frameworks and sustainability frameworks that you are helping to to devise at the at the regional level? So these are questions that I'm throwing into the discussion for a second round, and. Um, 
just to be fair to all speakers, I'm going to use the same uh, order that we used in the in the first round, and I'm going to pass the floor now, most immediately, to uh, our colleagues from ECA, uh, Jean Paul, and the floor is yours to elaborate a little bit more on the points you made in the first round. Thank you very much, uh, Yera. I think the the first thing that we do need to underline for Africa is that. The, despite good intentions, it has been very difficult to invest in a different model of uh, a different economic model because of the, the challenge of resource mobilization. So the, uh, the, I think the, the, on the positive side, in terms of the very good indications of where uh, Africa wants to go, we had uh, in January of this year, the adoption of the African Union Green Stimulus Program which outlined the key areas that they would like, that African leaders would like to see uh, that they are able to invest in terms of stimulus. And this is broadly aligned with the Secretary General's uh, priorities. It includes a focus on uh, the blue economy, uh, on climate resilience, on energy, uh, and uh, on, on nature-based solutions uh, amongst others. Uh, and it recognizes that uh, Africa must uh, adopt a low carbon development pathway and that net zero is, is preferable. Uh, but the net zero is situated within the context of achieving also zero poverty uh, and zero hunger and addressing the needs of the SDGs. Uh, and the, uh, so I think the, the, on the positive side, there is a, a great political will to go in this direction. Some practical examples would be also the, uh, Europe, the Ethiopians uh, Green Legacy Program, uh, where they have been investing in tree planting uh, which also creates immediate employment uh, in, uh, in, in uh, rural areas. So this has been relatively successful, but it is the challenge is how to sustain it when Ethiopia also, for example, does not have access to new finance and is uh, now applied for debt treatment under the common framework. And the, uh, so the, the, the concluding point would be to say that the, the gap in resources is really, I think, what's holding uh, Africa back. Uh, the, to put it in context, the, even the largest stimulus in African countries are still below 1% of GDP. Uh, and, the, uh, and the United States, for example, recently has had a stimulus, which is, uh, I think, almost 27% of, of GDP. So if we are really to be able to allow the change uh, in economic model and invest in these new areas, the resources need to be provided upfront. We hope that some of these resources will come through climate finance, uh, particularly with the COP, uh, coming up, and that African countries can also uh, in, invest themselves, but their fiscal space to do so is very limited. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Paul. And, and yeah, the resource mobilization is key. The, as you said very well, that the economic case is there, but uh, uh, resources are financial resources are needed. So, as you said, looking forward to, to the COP and hopefully and to some uh, active mobilization of resources in, in that uh, context. Thank you for, for giving us the, the specific examples. I'm now going to turn to, to Esqua, uh, to Ms. Rim Neshdawi. Um, perhaps, Rim, you can elaborate a little bit more on the examples you were mentioning before and share some uh, lessons learned from your region. Uh, Reem, the floor is Thank yours. you. Thank you very much. Um, our, our region is, is um, a, a bit of a unique situation due to the uh, conflicts and, and the um, uh, political instability that we face. And that affects actually not only the, the conflict countries, but also the neighboring countries. Uh, and, and that's why uh, probably the, the success stories are not... Uh, um, uh, scaled up and, and they stay at a, a, an initiative, a, a small program here and there. Um, and and uh, in spite of the fact that we have seven countries, for example, that have um, SCP um, uh, plans, they most of our countries have NDCs and, and um, uh, uh, have the national plans that uh, include uh, somehow uh, a part on greening here and there. Uh, including retreatment, treatment of uh, water, uh, uh, solar energy, uh, uh, etc. However, the success is, as I said, is, is limited. We have uh, recently, for example, um, 
uh, KSA announced uh, a 10 billion trees uh, project to reduce uh, carbon emissions and combat land desertification. This is a newly uh, uh, announced uh, um, uh, initiative. Um, we, we have to, to uh, monitor how it will uh, uh, affect the, the uh, situation in the country and in the neighboring uh, uh, region. However, um, the, the lessons learned from our uh, implementation of, of uh, few interventions, um, there must be a, a solid political will to back uh, any initiative to, to be able to scale it up and, and not stay as, as a, a program, a standalone project or program. Uh, a clear vision, actually, because we uh, also our countries suffer from uh, um, diverse strategies that are sometimes uh, um, uh, overlap and, and uh, waste resources, but at other times are um, uh, con contradicting. So um, uh, streamlining and having a, a, a direct uh, vision that can uh, and a clear vision that can uh, translate uh, uh, the, the, the vision into strategies and strategies into policies and programs uh, is also lacking. Uh, resource mobilization, I think uh, it is said uh, across the board, uh, there is an issue with resource mobilization, access to finance, uh, green financing, uh, specifically if we want to involve the private sector, they need an incentive. Um, they, um, involvement of the private sector is uh, inevitable uh, and, and crucially needed and, and to get them on board is uh, uh, needs also um, um, to mobilize the um, uh, resources, green financing, uh, etc. Um, the other issue that we, we also suffer from and we need to work on is, is data availability. Uh, policymakers need to um, have evidence for their uh, policy making and data issue is crucial. Uh, data availability, uh, accessibility is also uh, an issue. Um, enhancing uh, technology transfer has been a challenge and, and uh, there needs to be a focus uh, on uh, technology transfer south, south, through South-South cooperation or North-South cooperation. Um, the, the, our countries are not generators of uh, knowledge and, and needs support in that uh, direction and transfer of technology is uh, crucial for uh, moving forward specifically on issues of climate change and, and circularity. Uh, it is science-based and, and there is a need to bridge this also um, uh, uh, channel between uh, policy and science. Um, Regional cooperation is also a must. Uh, experience sharing and, and uh, uh, better use of resources. Um, there has been um, uh, challenges in that uh, direction due to the conflicts and the political instability that uh, we face. Nevertheless, um, I think our countries uh, have been making some progress on, on uh, issues uh, that are directly related to uh, green, um, circular, uh, sustainable economy. We can uh, call it whatever, but we know what is the core um, issues that we uh, discuss uh, uh, in terms of material use, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, water efficiency, uh, um, and, and uh, some uh, uh, progress in, in uh, uh, renewable energy uh, uh, share in, in total uh, final energy consumption. However, there is a lot to be done. I will stop here for uh, the two minutes. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Reem, for for reminding us the yeah, very the very unique challenges in in your region and and the added the challenge of of the conflict. Uh, uh, background in for for the countries in in your region, and and also thank you for for bringing very important dimensions that uh, we didn't perhaps mention so much in the first round, like the need to involve the private sector, 
uh, you know, to, to address the, the financing challenge and, and also the question of, uh, of data and, um, and the opportunities around uh, technology and, and digital cooperation, which were mentioned also uh, by our colleague from ESCAP, the, the enormous opportunities due to the exponential growth in, in that particular in that particular sector. So these are critical issues that I think are valid across the region. So thank you for uh, bringing them to, to the discussion and, and reminding us also the, of, of the very acute challenges that specifically your region uh, faces. I will now um, move again to the Latin American Caribbean uh, region. Um, dear Jose Luis, and the floor is yours now for perhaps some specific examples of lessons learned from your region. Thanks, Yara. Well, one of the first lessons that we learned was that we needed a fast means of communication with society. So we created a, a special vehicle, which was a COVID publication where we could report the state of things for, for the governments in Latin America in terms of the economic impacts of, of the pandemic, and also to be able to advocate for the very short-term solutions. And one of those was to use as a funding mechanism the closing of the gaps created by illusion and evasion in the taxing system to be able to allocate those funds uh, into uh, quick response measures, such as what? For example, trying to close the digital divide, which was made so obvious by the seclusion measures, by the quarantines, where only a very small proportion of society was able to do teleworking and didn't have even the, the, the material means to uh, be able to continue their activities and be informed through digital means. Another one was to enhance uh, the coverage of social protection uh, to create a citizen's income uh, with uh, where they, at, at that moment we calculated it was uh, costing about 1.5 GDP points, which is completely manageable if we close the loops of evasion and tax illusion, illegal behaviors in, in the taxing system. We also use that, uh, that ad hoc vehicle of communication to advocate uh, uh, around what uh, John Paul and Marco have already underlined, which is the recovery of public services, basic public services, which are also, by the way, low in environmental footprint, low in imports, and high in, in, in work and wages. Water and sanitation systems, rescuing and maintaining the transport, uh, the public transport systems, the mass transit systems. Uh, and of course, the uh, something that had been already there for a while, which is debt alleviation for highly indebted countries and highly vulnerable to climate change, like the Caribbean countries. Uh, exchanges of debt for resilience. That was the first emergency measure, a very good lesson learned. Second, we need to strengthen the dialogue with the finance ministries and the economic uh, ministries of the economy, which are the ones implementing the recovery funds. And this narrative has to change. That what, what Kurt Garrigan was, was pointing out, like, why are they not responding in the right way? Well, that has to be confronted. That has to be in a dialogue. So we have to dialogue more with the uh, economic areas of governments which are implementing emergency resources. I would uh, finalize just by not to taking too much time by underlining one way that we think has to be sustained in the medium and long term. And I'll just use one example. The region has industry, has, has automotive industry, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, they have strong industries. At the same time, as, as uh, Kurt was saying, cities play a major role. We are the most urbanized developing uh, region in the world. We are talking about rescuing and enhancing the quality of public transit systems. So that demand, that, that demand of vehicles depends on the planning, the correct planning, long-term planning of the cities. That is the demand. The supply is the industrial sector. If we manage to organize demand around industries that can be supplied regionally, 
then we are keeping all the positive externalities of changing to a better pattern of consumption and into a better pattern of production. We keep the employment, the learning, the, uh, the lower carbon footprint within the region. We help to achieve the 2030 agenda. And that is true for all the rest of the sectors. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jose Luis. And thank you also for connecting to some of the points made by, by our colleagues earlier. Um, and to, 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 you know, for bringing, insisting of this question of, of communicating with uh, society. And, and indeed the pandemic has really revealed that, that many of the vulnerabilities that were there, but have just revealed them in, a, in an emergency mode and, and has brought to the fore the need to, to really rethink and, and reinforce um, very basic public policies and public services in the areas of, as you said, in, in obviously in health and in, in other social areas, but also transport and, and uh, and the need to, to also bring in the, to the discussion the ministries of, of finance and to, to, to have a, some sort of nexus dialogues as well at the national level incorporating the sectoral ministries and the, and the ministries of finance. And, uh, and also thank you for insisting of, of the role of urban centers of the cities as really uh, centers for, of, of, of demand and for generation of patterns of consumption and production that are sustainable. So these are all very critical points that are emerging from, from our discussion. And uh, I will now move immediately for the more specific examples and also lessons learned for the very interesting experiences that uh, our colleague from the ECE region has shared earlier. Uh, Mr. Marco Kainer, the, the floor is yours for, for a second round. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Of course, I will not repeat what I said, but I would like to uh, go a little bit more into <laughs> detail. Uh, as you know, the ECE region is somewhat uh, different from all the other regions because here we have uh, 56 member states of which uh, 39 are not program countries. That means that uh, a lot of uh, good practice and lessons learned are also created outside of uh, the UN system. Um, well, uh, when it comes to recovery packages, I just want to mention that the EU had already adopted its uh, European Green Deal um, before the pandemic struck and uh, has now added its so-called uh, next generation uh, EU recovery fund. And uh, late in uh, 2020 also the EU has adopted a green agenda for the Western Balkans. So we are benefiting a lot from this uh, invaluable work uh, done by the EU. But nonetheless, the uh, ECE has also been active uh, both for program countries and others. Um, the last session of the commission that uh, was back in uh, some weeks ago, was dedicated to circular economy. And also I want to remind that for the past decade, our Environment for Europe ministerial process has had uh, a green economy focus, which will continue even to next year's uh, ninth uh, ministerial session in Cyprus. Um, uh, also, uh, last month, we had the fifth uh, high-level uh, meeting on transport health and environment, which is a, a nexus area uh, uh, and, and bringing together ministers of health, transport and environment. And, and over 40 ministerial level speakers uh, declared uh, for building forward better by transforming to new clean, safe, healthy, and inclusive mobility and transport. And such declarations are very uh, important. They give the, the uh, overall guidance, the framework for uh, future policies at the national level. Um, uh, moreover, our uh, programs have uh, issued guidance documents on a green, uh, resilient, and sustainable recovery in areas like energy and renewables, transport, cities, uh, forestry, um, trade and innovation. Uh, and in addition, we have also um, given more targeted uh, national and sub-regional support to 
program countries. And here I would like to mention uh, uh, something very important that we are co-chairing with uh, UNEP and UNESCO, a new uh, interagency, it was mentioned in the beginning, uh, issue-based coalition on environment and climate change in Europe and Central Asia. This is a coalition that uh, is comprised of 18 members from the UN system. And uh, this coalition has been responding to uh, requests by uh, re resident coordinators and UN uh, country teams who called for our support. The uh, uh, responses have included uh, replies to really specific questions by them and have uh, resulted in summary recommendations on COVID-19 recovery and also a compendium on measures to green the post-pandemic recovery. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. And uh, it's, it's very interesting the case of your region precisely because of the diverse uh, set of uh, countries that, that you cover and where you have the European Union, obviously, with, the, with already a lot of um, um, guidance and policy work on 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 these matters and and reminding us on the importance of partnerships so with uh, with the organizations outside the the un system and and also uh thank you for giving us a specific example of an issue-based coalition where uh, again we we are really very excited about all this uh, the the operationalization of these new tools that the review of the un development system has has uh, has brought and, uh, uh, and precisely in these questions like in the development and the implementation of the circular economy uh, guidances uh, is critical and, and is critical to, to respond to the to the demands of the of the country level. So um, thank you again for for giving us a bit more background of the activities that uh, UNICE is engaged on on this front. And finally, I'm going to now pass the floor as well to our colleague uh, from ESCAP, Kariga, uh, part of you want to elaborate on specific uh, lessons uh, learned or success experiences from your region, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I know I went over time last time, so I'll try to be <laughs> brief and within my, my allotted time. Um, I, I think one of the things that is, um, is somewhat um, specific to this region, although some others may, may see this as well, is that we're seeing within the context of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and this is a pattern that was happening before, is a, is a significantly changing urban and rural dynamic. And as we talk about a circular economy and, and resource consumption um, that may be overly driven by urban areas, there really is need, needs to be a, a, a shift in, in the way that we think about um, the, the nexus between uh, water and energy and food and, and resources um, that go back and forth between urban and rural areas. Uh, because this area, this region is, is um, urbanizing at such a rapid pace where I think we're seeing those impacts uh, much more clearly. Um, as it relates to, to the circular economy, uh, what we've tried to focus on is not just a circular economy, but an inclusive circular economy because nearly 70% of the, of, the, um, of the workforce in this region is in the informal economy uh, and they lack so social protections. Um, there are a number of, uh, of vulnerabilities that um, are associated with informal settlements and, and where this uh, uh, informal workers um, are located as well. But we see some some opportunities. I'll just focus on one one sector in particular in the in the waste sector, where uh, the informal uh, sector is very much engaged in in waste management. Um, there are some some um, some instances, for instance, in in Pune, India, where uh, the informal waste pickers actually divert about half of the plastic from landfill. And I think there are lots of opportunities to, to in, the, in the context of recoveries, to really look at where are the intersections between the informal economy and the formal economy. Uh, because there are opportunities um, for a circular economy to be built around some of those intersections. 
that would have multiple benefits um, to informal workers, but also uh, identify opportunities for um, increased uh, incomes to, to those workers. Also offset some of the environmental costs that, that cities, um, for instance, may ordinarily incur from solid waste management. Some cities in this region spend about 40% or more of their municipal budgets on solid waste management. So there's, there really is a, a significant opportunity to, to look at um, those intersections through, through the uh, a nexus lens. But because our region has such a high population of, of um, informal workers uh, and a, a large percentage in the informal economy, that that is really a, a significant uh, opportunity. Um, ESCAP generally is looking at you know, protecting people and, and enhancing resilience, and I think that would be a component of it. Um, and restoring supply chains and supporting small and medium-sized enterprises is, is one of our focus areas as well. But um, I just wanted to highlight the informal economy and, and the informal sector because it is such a significant uh, component in this region. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. And indeed, this is a very important intersection that you are highlighting between the informal sector and, and the formal economy and, and the opportunities around it to, to build back or big forward uh, better. And, and it's a very clear case of, uh, of uh, you know, opportunities for multidimensional impacts in the social aspect, but also environmental aspects. So uh, thank you for, for, um, for focusing on this. Uh, on this particular uh, example that I think it's, it's very relevant in your region, but also pertinent to, to others. So uh, with this, uh, we have concluded the second round of interventions uh, from the, our speakers and we thank them very much. And uh, I believe that we are going to open the floor now for questions from the floor. And uh, um, I think um, I'm going to ask also Nina for help here. Um, I understand that uh, we have a question here in the in the Q and A chat. Um, I'm going to read it aloud. Uh, please, Nina, if you can let me know if I, you know, if there are other questions uh, uh, that I should uh, that I should uh, read. Um, okay, let me see. Yeah, I see here additional questions. Um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to. Um, and there are a number of additional questions that we want we have to ask you to to address but i also see that there is a question from the audience and i think i'm going to um, prioritize uh, now and there is a question addressed to to card from escap um saying why do we have only urban focused intervention recommended uh, how do you see other nexus issues such as water energy and food nexus policy issues in the region i think some of these questions have already uh, been partially addressed but i'm gonna give the floor to kurt um, very briefly to respond to this particular question and then i will come back to the other broader questions that uh, we had for the discussion kurt yeah, the, I, the floor yeah. is yours yeah. Thanks. I may have partially answered it in, in my last intervention, but I think you know the fact that we see such a, a significant change uh, in the urban-rural dynamic, uh, where cities are actually driving much of the consumption and, and resource demands from rural areas. Um, but and I highlighted some urban-focused interventions as as examples. But um, I, I do think, um, and it is you know, it is accurate that we need to focus as much on the nexus of water, energy, and food in rural areas as well, um, so that we can in some ways disconnect and, and build uh, resilient rural communities as, uh, at the same time that we're building urban resilience. Uh, but we need to closely analyze that th th those changing dynamics, both from a um, land consumption standpoint, urban sprawl, uh, as well as resource and energy demands um, going forward. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kurt. While I give the opportunity for others to come in with any specific question, I'm going to ask the, the panel to address very briefly um, the broader question of the, of the enabling environment. Uh, and while we regions are pursuing to build back better, 
um, what does an enabling environment look like to support integrated and nexus policy making approaches? If you can elaborate on this a little bit more um, in brief uh, responses, I know we are asking too much, and that would be um, very good. And uh, I understand that our colleague from ECA has to leave um, shortly. So if you're still around, Jean Paul, you may wish to address this very quickly, uh, and then we move on to the other speakers. Uh, Jean Paul, are you still around? The floor is I'm still. I'm still here, around. Yara. Thank okay. you very much, uh, and thank you for understanding that. Un unfortunately, I will have to rush off. Uh, but I think the uh, the enabling environment. Uh, firstly, we we have looked at it from the in terms of the work that ECA is doing, what are the uh, the platforms that need to be in place uh, to really facilitate uh, a green recovery? And uh, and this, of course, is so. If we look at energy, there are a number of uh, of issues around the enabling environment. There's the uh, there's the regulatory space, and we are doing an intervention through an SDG seven initiative, which supports uh, countries that wish to, for example. Uh, structure their energy sector uh, to make it attractive for private investment, uh, to look at the uh, financing uh, flows, uh, to have uh, the frameworks for public-private partnership uh, agreements in that sector, um, as well as looking at issues such as the uh, channeling investment into distribution and transmission uh, network. So, so energy is, is one of those platforms which uh, the regulation uh, is, is very important. And it also has a bearing on the, the regional basis. Um, for example, in Africa, we're seeing the development gradually of regional power pools, which includes as well the regulations around uh, how energy is transferred across borders, how this is uh, traded in a transparent fashion, uh, and ensuring that information is available to all parties, uh, governments, uh, the private sector, potential investors, as well as uh, stakeholders. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I give that as one example, but the the same applies and uh, for, for many of the other sectors which are enablers, including uh, food security, we need to look at the, uh, we need to create that certainty, for example, for, uh, for investors and for farmers. So if we look at food security on the African continent, uh, there's essentially a dichotomy. We've got the majority of producers who are smallholder farmers, but we also have uh, large producers who are becoming more important and probably will continue to do so. And we believe that there is space for, for both of those in a uh, sustainable food security uh, system in Africa, where you can support the smallholder uh, farmer, give them the security that they will be able to sell their product, that the value chain uh, exists, that there is uh, access to the market, and that they are also protected by the regulations uh, that are in place. So those are just sort of two examples on sectors of, of the enabling environment that is necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean Paul. This was a very good illustration. And, and thank you also for, for being with us uh, today. It's uh, bringing the, the perspectives of the, of the African region. So uh, I'm going to move now to our dear colleague, Rim. If you can elaborate just for one more minute on, on, on the enabling environment in, in your region and also looking to how to, how to really build long term policy responses. Uh, Rim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yara. Actually, this is very interesting, uh, the, the question. Uh, in the past, uh, ESCO has been um, uh, supporting the, the League of Arab States through its uh, uh, multiple uh, ministerial councils in um, establishing, developing uh, strategies at the regional level and then, um, uh, uh, in a way, promoting uh, the, the issues, uh, the, the sectors uh, that uh, these uh, strategies uh, are built around. And um, in, a, in a similar manner, I think we, uh, the region, uh, needs an updated multi-sectoral uh, policy reference uh, document um, or a guiding framework uh, of action to, to build back better. Um, and, and within the green or circular economy framework. Um, this, uh, this reference document, uh, and, and, and it should be multi-sectoral, um, 
can, uh, uh, can use uh, the institutional setup that is available within the League of Arab States with the support of uh, uh, regional actors such as ESQA and uh, other UN system uh, organizations uh, to follow up on the implementation at the regional level. Um, in the past, we have used uh, the Council of Arab Ministers responsible for environment uh, with its technical uh, uh, committee uh, arm and, and, it, and other mechanisms for implementation and follow-up on implementation. Uh, of course, regional um, uh, civil society is, is also part of, of this uh, 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 process because they have, uh, they are, closer to the civil society at the national level and that civil society at the national level is is, is uh, cooperating with civil society at the local level and this chain can really support implementation at different levels um, accompanying uh, uh, support for legislation uh, at the national level so this regional uh, institutional setup should trickle down to the uh, national level for implementation the, the countries are in the driver's seat and they are responsible about implementation. Our support should be on, on guiding them in, in this process and, and providing the right setup and, and monitoring framework. Um, close coordination with the, the different developmental actors uh, uh, at the regional level, uh, um, specifically that the, the issue is multi-sectoral. We cannot work at sectoral level solely. Uh, implementation and planning should be done at a, a multi-sectoral level. Um, and as I said uh, previously, we have uh, uh, embarked onto this uh, uh, pilot uh, uh, water uh, food uh, uh, coordination mechanism, and it is starting to give fruits. It takes time because this coordination really takes time. So we have to be patient. Uh, uh, partnership development uh, to ensure harmonization and, and uh, uh, use of, of uh, 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 resources, support to, um, uh, to support for the region to access green financing and support for the region to develop uh, developmental uh, funds that can support regional initiatives. And, and we know that sustainable development uh, 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 regional in, uh, or in, uh, across borders initiatives are crucial. Climate change issues don't know borders. Water issues don't know borders. Um, uh, uh, land issues are affected by um, across the borders. So there is a need for this uh, regional uh, coalition, cooperation uh, against uh, uh, environmental issues. Um, and and uh, also I cannot stress uh, more on the issues of, of stronger ties between policy setting and uh, 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 science and, and data and evidence. This is really crucial. Um, I, I think also would uh, uh, the, the region would benefit from a platform uh, to cater for the nexus approach. Uh, the, this can be uh, um, uh, through the, the, the regional platform, um, the regional uh, sustainable development forums and others. And I would like to also uh, see that that this EMG uh, uh, group uh, can present an excellent umbrella for us as the UN uh, uh, development uh, workers uh, and, and to, to tighten this cooperation and, and uh, experience sharing uh, between uh, different actors that we can also project on our work at the regional level. This is very important. We're uh, talking globally but we can also uh, take this at the regional level and, and implement um, the, the issue of knowledge across borders is of, of uh, crucial uh, uh, importance at, at this level of our knowledge um, in, in the regions. I have some uh, just uh, 
uh, a quick uh, uh, notion that we have uh, uh, implemented a, a regional uh, initiative of climate change back in the 2008 we started or seven and it's been building up and and uh, building a coalition and we have uh, started a regional uh, knowledge hub on climate change issues uh, that we work with regional actors like the League of Arab States and AXAD and etc. and the regional actors of, of the UN like FAO, UNEP, UNESCO, among others, UNDP, of course, and, and others. Um, I will stop here, but I would like to thank you very much for, the, uh, for stressing on the regional level work that we think is, is um, uh, sometimes overlooked. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Rima. And you use terms that are really critical and have come up in the discussion very often, like the multi-sectoral responses, the leveraging other regional organizations and, and building partnerships with uh, other regional actors, but also with uh, civil society and the stakeholders in the regions, which are in the end critical to ensure the, 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 the inclusiveness and the durability of, of all the, the policy responses and the ownership of the responses and to ensure that there is momentum in the in the long run. So uh, thank you for, for that. I will now move our next in the list is Jose Luis uh, from uh, ECLAC. Please, uh, you have the floor. If you have a word on the question of the enabling environment. Thank you. Thank you, Yera, yes. Uh, well, I think the, the key word for the enabling environment is coherence. You have to need all the instruments of public policy well aligned for the public sector to, to respond properly and for the public sector to respond properly too. And by coherence, I mean coherence in, for example, the taxing policy, the financial policy, the regulatory policy, the research and development policy. Let me use uh, a couple of examples that would illustrate very clearly. We're, uh, and both have to, to do indirectly with circular economy too. We are seeing here in our economies two possibilities which are emerging. One is to start to produce wood substitutes and construction material substitutes based on recycled plastics. We're also seeing the possibility of retrofitting internal combustion vehicles into electric vehicles. But the regulation is not ready. The funding in the financial institutions is not ready. The fiscal treatment of these technological emerging productive activities is not clear. And there's very little research and development in both options. If instead of a, a, a cloud, an unclear cloud of public policy, we take the opportunity to align the incentives, we would have two additional sectors in our economies with additional employment, with additional taxing, with less imports, more opportunities to export, and therefore, again, reconciling the three areas for sustainable development. So enabling means coherent, looking forward. Carbon taxing is good, but it's basically a stick. When we say enabling, we have to think on the carrots to diversify the economy. Uh, I think also, and here, uh, Reem made a very good point. Regional multilateralism has uh, different opportunities than global multilateralism. And creating the economies of scale, the interoperability, the harmonization of policies is uh, very apt for the regional environment. Kurt was mentioning, for example, new sources of information, satellite information. Well, that should be shared across the regions. It should be a universal effort across the regions if we want to compare numbers and see how we align public policy to targets. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Luis. A very important notion as well, uh, coherence, policy coherence for sustainable development and, and how to address the question of the trade-offs and also to provide the right incentives, incentives for action. 
So in the interest of time, I'm going to move now quickly to our colleagues in ECE. Mr. Marco Kenner, the floor is yours. Please, a word on the naval environment. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I can fully subscribe to what's been said by the previous speaker already, but for the ECE region, I would like to be more specific and add some uh, enabling environments. Of course, uh, you mentioned, I mentioned already the EC multilateral environmental agreements that are providing a very strong uh, legal background uh, for uh, assessing environmental and health impacts of uh, sectoral policies and uh, projects. Um, there are more enabling env uh, environments from different uh, areas. For example, I also want to mention that we urgently need acceleration measures to implement the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. And uh, another um, enabling environment is clearly the regional integration with a new UN system in the region that brings together uh, the strengths of different uh, of various UN agencies in order to help uh, the member states. Public-private partnership, of course, uh, is also a, a factor. Um, I just leave it at this bullet point. Uh, it also comes to my mind uh, for measuring and monitoring the progress towards the SDGs, a more integrated approach to data and statistics uh, would uh, clearly be needed. And um, uh, well, maybe again, the, the nexus approach is, uh, is, is key. The nexus approach uh, that I already mentioned, water, uh, ecosystems, environment, and energy. Uh, we have worked on uh, four different nexus areas here in the UNECE. And uh, we have made very good uh, experience with that. Uh, because it broke silos in-house and, and uh, within member states. And talking about breaking silos, also national policy dialogues on various themes. We do it on, on water. It's possible also in industrial accidents uh, or industrial safety. And it's, it's a cross-cutting issue. So uh, to, to bring together uh, decision makers from governments in countries who very often do not even know each other. So I think that's a contribution that we can make at, at the same time, this methodology I would classify as an enabling environment. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, for insisting on, on the, the points of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the regional dialogues, the regional integration, also the national policy dialogues is never enough and to build the necessary uh, partnership. So uh, thank you, these are fundamental issues. So, so thank you for insisting on those aspects. Um, finally, for the uh, word on, on the Navy environment, I'm going to pass the floor to our SCAP colleague, Kurt, and the floor is yours. Uh, first, let me just echo many of the same comments that uh, my, my colleagues have already said. Uh, I, I think issues like development funds uh, for regional initiatives um, are important. Um, you know, the, the, the transboundary issues that have been already mentioned, climate water, uh, I would add air pollution to that, require really a, a strong regional cooperation um, and the regional commissions that can provide certainly that, that platform for that. But there are, and, and especially in the, in the Asia Pacific region, some sub-regional institutions um, that are very important in, in supporting uh, that cooperation. For instance, ASEAN um, in, the, in Southeast Asia is a very strong institution. There are other um, in Northeast Asia and, and South Asia that focus on, uh, uh, on environmental solutions and sharing and exchanging um, the, the, the lessons across the sub-regions, I think, is, is a significant role for, for ESCAP. Um, I think as it relates to um, some other enabling environments without being repetitive. I think the vertical integration uh, of subnational and local authorities with, uh, with national governments is, um, is not far enough along, uh, certainly in this region. Uh, while we know that um, what's happening a, a lot is um, 
you know, even in the development of the, of the NDCs that um, realizing the potential of, of cities is, is simply not incorporated sufficiently. Uh, certainly in, in the first round of NDCs, it was, they were not. Uh, and hopefully that, um, you know, the actions that are being taken at the local and, and um, subnational level will be further um, recognized and incorporated. Uh, that said, we see within this region um, a number of voluntary local reviews being undertaken um, in, in, the, in the very same manner that voluntary national reviews are, are, are being undertaken by, by countries to uh, monitor and track progress against the SDGs. Uh, we see that uh, the VLR mechanism and process as really being a, a mechanism for that vertical integration to be um, strengthened. Uh, we often see the, the capacity gaps at the local level, uh, but more importantly, we see the policy gaps um, that exist between national policies and local policies. And that often restricts what, you know, progress in the region at whatever, for whatever sector. And I think that comes back to Jose Luis's, um, you know, emphasis on coherence. I think that you cannot, um, overstate that, that, that we need to see coherence um, across all levels of, of governance. Uh, but we also need to see it within the UN system. And I think the issue-based coalitions um, really are coming together to see how the, the UN system can also have bring um, coherent delivery uh, to resident coordinators, to the UN country teams, and really leverage the, the full capacity of the UN system to support um, you know, action and um, and address some of these governance issues as well. So um, I think that's enough for me for now. So I'll turn it Thank back you. over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Kurt. And, and again, very critical elements, uh, coherence again inside and outside the, the UN system and, and, and the opportunity around this issue-based coalitions and the importance of vertical integration, the sub-regional level and, and the local level were very interesting interventions are already taking place and multi-sectorial, as Ring was saying, uh, interventions so that we could uh, look at for, for illustration. So thank you very much to, to all the, the panelists. And, and I know this is a very, very rich discussion and, and, and the panelists here are the real experts. And, and I, I feel bad that we always have to cut these discussions. It always seems that we don't have the sufficient time, but I want to, to thank you very warmly to, to all and to perhaps highlight a few elements as some, you know, sort of a, a wrapping up remarks and um, also apologize to the audience for the lack of time for discussion and, and, and insist on the opportunity to follow up by email later and, and through our colleague uh, Nina. So the elements I have captured as uh, key elements that come across uh, the five regions is obviously the, the crisis of the, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to build forward or to build back better and uh, the economic case uh, around uh, the many of these uh, uh, opportunities and these uh, uh, recovery policies, the, the need of partnerships, partnerships on to re mobilize resources, partnership to mobilize finance, but also to to make sure that um, that there is uh, work on on data, that on generation uh, sharing of, of data would for to de develop evidence based uh, policy responses, as the work colleagues in ESQA were insisting on. The importance of, of, uh, of really developing a, a, a narrative that, that contrib contributes to, 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 to you know, build a political vision, to build a political uh, guidance for, uh, for action in the regions. And uh, we have identified many opportunities for action, but as our ESCAP colleagues were saying, there are still many countries that have not developed a reco not recovery uh, policies uh, uh, around the, you know, the, the, the opportunity of the, of the response to, to the pandemic. So we have to continue developing this multi-sectoral narrative and, and advocating for, for integrated responses to uh, address the, the recovery, but also the sustainable development and climate challenges. Uh, and um, obviously, uh, and final point, the, the importance of, of regional cooperation. Uh, we, this is just, a, a, the, the meeting today is just a specific example of how many best practices we can, we can identify when looking at experiences in, in the regions. Uh, the importance of the transboundary responses to address many of these uh, questions to uh, also to, to mobilize uh, finance, to, uh, to develop normative uh, frameworks and to develop uh, regional guidance frameworks that are critical to, to entice an action at the, at the country level. All this happens to, to thanks to regional cooperation and 
thanks to the work of the regional commissions. And it's, as I say, from a New York perspective, it's a, it's a critical building block of action at the global level. And very often when here at the global level, we are stuck and unable to identify global consensus on many of these critical issues, we look to the regions. And that's where we have, where we find specific responses, specific multi-sectoral responses to, to, the, to the challenges, the climate sustainable development challenges. So uh, I will stop here and I will now uh, pass the floor for a closing remarks um, to um, Mr. Hossein um, Fadei, uh, who will give uh, the closing remarks and want to reiterate again, very warm thanks to, to the panelists for this important discussion. Mr. Hossein, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yara, and thank you the colleagues uh, from the regions and the audience. Uh, this has been really a fantastic uh, dialogue. I personally enjoyed it a lot. This could have not been better to have uh, such a comprehensive uh, gathering of uh, various uh, regions, uh, thoughts, ideas, and also the challenges that we have uh, sort of uh, witnessed uh, in countries and regions in um, uh, helping countries towards um, a green recovery pathway. Um, I think uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, for, for us in the environment management group, this is a real um, honor to have been able to gather uh, all these regions together. I hope that uh, first and foremost, this dialogue uh, would actually ameliorate uh, the interlinkages and also the collaboration amongst the regions firstly, to learn from each other. I saw the diversity of challenges, but also the diversity of uh, views uh, and the areas where the regions can help each other at one level. But I also saw that uh, how uh, interesting these thoughts and these uh, ideas are for EMG as we are going to develop a common narrative for the UN system on the green recovery as part of one of our interagency processes in the EMG. Um, I have already taken a lot of notes from this discussion that uh, definitely will inform we will be sharing that narrative with you, uh, certainly, to make sure that uh, it is informed of the various thoughts and ideas that you have shared. The whole hope, I mean, the, 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 the purpose of this narrative is really for, 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 it, for it to be a reference point for the entire UN system so that they speak also with one language to the regions and also to the government. And then we basically be able to, following that, uh, to help uh, you know, the regions and also the UN offices in, 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 the, in the countries and the others to come with uh, perhaps some consistency in terms of language. But it is very clear that we hear, you know, perspectives in Africa that, uh, you know, they're challenged with the resources, that there are also perspectives in Europe, that they are building on existing instruments. Uh, it's so fascinating to, to see this um, the, the diversity of uh, issues and challenges. Um, we have also some conferences ahead of us, like the Spoken Plus 50, that is going to address the green recovery as one of the topics. And we hope that this conference actually would allow us to, uh, as the next 50 years agenda for the environment, can actually give us some directions on how do we help countries to towards this green recovery pathway. Uh, so this input of this discussion can also feed into the deliberations of the Spoken Plus 50 conference in next year in June 2022. Um, um, following this uh, dialogue, as I said, we will prepare a summary. We will share it with you, the panelists, for your review, and then we will obviously uh, use that also in the preparation of our, our common uh, green recovery narrative. Uh, and then uh, hopefully moving towards, we will have the heads of the UN agencies meetings in the EMG in uh, October, hopefully. And that would allow us again to take the next step because I saw a lot of uh, requests uh, in terms of perhaps uh, having some sort of um, uh, assistance, uh, especially through the UN country offices, to UN resident coordinators, etc., to, to help. And we need to, to do some preparations of how do we do that and how do we put our complementaries together. We know that there are some processes that are very much focused on the social economic dimensions of the recovery. Uh, but we would like also this to be integrated into those. Uh, one of the messages from the last senior officials to us was, let us please help countries not to develop uh, uh, green recovery, the recovery policies that will be in parallel to the existing uh, sort of uh, policies or existing uh, goals 
under the SDGs and so on. And one of our aims is basically to, to, to improve and to actually grow this integrated approach, the nexus approach uh, for these things to be considered all together. So not to repeat uh, whatever has been said, uh, but really to reiterate the intention of the environment management to, to be still uh, a, a forum for all these regions, all these perspectives to come together so that we can uh, produce the, the necessary normative materials that it can be used by, by member states and by the countries. Uh, so uh, again, a warm a words of really thank you to you, Yera, to really uh, bringing all these regions together, to all colleagues who have shared their perspectives, and that we would very much like to stay in touch with you to, uh, again, enrich our papers, our thoughts, um, based on the information that we receive from the from the region. This has been fabulous, honestly, comparing to the, not that the others have not been interesting, but this is really the uh, hardcore data and, and, and perspectives coming from the region based on your information. And this is really invaluable to us. So thank you so much for, for all this input. And uh, if there is a, a question in terms of the next step, I'd be happy to answer, but I'm, I'm really uh, thankful to all of you for attending and uh, look forward to our future collaboration in the ENP. With that, um, Nina, I pass it on to you. If there's any housekeeping messages that is still we need to communicate, please uh, mention it to the audience. Over to you. No, well, that is everything. Thank you so much. And uh, the recorded playback will be available on the landing page that brought you to this registration. Uh, please keep abreast upon uh, any background documents and the outcome document there. So I thank you all for coming today and have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you very much. It was really a great opportunity to see colleagues. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.